Welcome to this Renewable Integration Study webinar on Managing Frequency. This webinar is designed to give a technical overview of some of the findings related to the frequency work stream of the Renewable Integration Study, recently published on AMO's website. This is part of a five-part series of webinars on the Renewable Integration Study and builds upon the introductory RIS 101 webinar and the technical overview. To read the RIS publications or view the other webinars in the series, please head to the major publications page on AMO's website. So presenting this webinar today will be myself, Andrew Paver, and my colleague, Jane Yu. We are part of the Future Energy Systems team looking at the frequency component of the Renewable Integration Study. The structure of this webinar today will be, Jane will lead you through some of the key concepts related to frequency control, We'll then look at the overall approach we use to study frequency control out to 2025. We'll go through some of the key results of our analysis and then look at some of the actions required going forward. I'll now hand you over to Jane to go through some of the key concepts. Thanks, Andrew. So let's get started with some key concepts on frequency and power systems. And the first one of those being frequency. So you may have heard from other webinars in the RIS series already that it's really important in a power system to maintain the balance between supply and demand on the system. And that's because electricity travels very close to the speed of light, meaning it has to be consumed at the same time that it is generated. Frequency helps us to measure this balance in real time. So it's very much like the heartbeat of the power system that everything is in sync to. In the NIM, a perfectly balanced system would be at 50 hertz, meaning it repeats 50 times per second. And you might get any natural variations in either supply and demand that might shift this value slightly up or down. In addition to these natural variations, we can also have sudden frequency disturbances on the system, which generally is something like when we lose a very large load or generating unit on the power system. And in this case, on the screen here, we can see that losing a very large coal unit will lead to a scenario of imbalance. In the center dial, we can see that frequency has dropped into the red zone. And when this happens, and or if the rate of change of frequency is too fast, certain parts of the system can be damaged or they'll trip themselves off to prevent themselves from being damaged. Either of these cases is not really what we want. And so to prevent this from happening, we use what are called frequency control services to manage frequency disturbances. To explain frequency control, what we'll do now is do a quick walkthrough of what happens to frequency following a disturbance using the example from the previous slide of where we lost that coal unit. At the start, during normal operation, where everything is in balance, frequency will sit at or very close to 50 Hertz. Then, when the generator is lost, frequency will begin to drop, and during these initial stages, the online inertia from large spinning machines connected to the network determines the rate of change of frequency, the rock-off. If we continue on, we have primary frequency control enabled generation reserves, which act in response to locally detected frequency changes. What this means is that these generators will be measuring the frequency at their local connection points and have some headroom or footroom available to act in response to these large disturbance events. If there is enough of this reserve available, the frequency decline will be arrested. In the NEM, these kinds of services are provided through the contingency products of the Frequency Control Ancillary Services, or FCAS markets, which helps ensure that there is a base level of reserve that has primary frequency control enabled. To then bring the frequency back to 50 Hz, Secondary frequency control services are used to reset the system to balance. In the NIM, this reset is achieved by automatic generation control. Really, what this means is that there is a combination of different frequency control services that are interacting with each other to help manage frequency in the system. And these all need to be considered together going forward into 2025. I'll now pass back to Andrew to go through how we considered these in our study approach. Thanks, Jane. So to look at managing frequency out to 2025, we started off by asking three main questions. The first question we ask is, what is required to manage frequency for credible events, such as the trip of a single generating unit, as Jane has described previously? 
So to answer this question, we first looked at how managing credible events would look using the existing frequency control arrangements. The second question we asked is what is changing for non-credible events? So non-credible events are events that are larger than a single generation trip, such as the trip of multiple generating units. The third thing we looked at was the inertia requirements for the system. So in the NEM, we have processes and procedures in place to manage inertia under special conditions where part of the system is islanded or at risk of islanding. What we are looking at here is the inertia requirements for the usual condition of the system being an intact configuration. So to put this in context, since the start of the FCAS markets in 2001, a number of parameters fundamental to frequency control in the NEM have changed. To start with the largest generating unit, which is the risk we manage through the purchase of raised contingency FCAS, has increased from 660 megawatts to a typical value of 750 megawatts. That's important because it has a direct influence on the rate of change of frequency following a disturbance. Also over this time period, we've seen a decrease in inertia. So inertia is provided by the rotating mass of rotating plant directly connected to the power system. As wind and solar have displaced that rotating generation, we've seen the overall level of a system inertia decline. A similar story with load relief. So load relief is the change in motor load that happens in response to a change in frequency. As more of that motor load has been connected through electronics, this dynamic support of frequency has reduced. We've recently started purchasing more contingent FCAS because of this decline in load relief. We've also seen a change in the dynamics of reserve brought about by new technologies providing frequency supportive services. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later. We've seen the emergence of distributed PV as a secondary risk. So a secondary risk is the trip or reduction of generation that can occur alongside the primary risk or the trip of a large generating unit. So all of these factors have changed the outcomes of credible events, but they also feed into what the potential outcomes of non-credible events may be. And we'll have a look at that in some detail as well. So a little bit more about the decreasing level of inertia. This chart here shows the inertia in the mainland NEM. And we can see there that the level of inertia has been progressively declining from 2015 to 2019. That shaded blue area on the curve represents the projected outcomes of inertia out to 2025, and it comes from our market modeling. So we have multiple sets of market models that have different input assumptions and can give different outcomes in terms of system inertia. The lowermost edge of that area is a conservative view of where inertia could go, and it comes from short run marginal cost modeling. And what that shows is that by 2025, inertia could go as low as the amount maintained through the minimum system unit combinations or the units that must be online to support system strength. Jane will now take you through some of the core areas of our analysis and the results. Thanks, Andrew. So Recall the same slide that Andrew had before of the changes that have happened since the FCAS markets were first introduced and draw our attention to these first five points. So these changes have a direct impact first and foremost on the frequency sensitive reserve requirements for managing credible events. And this part of the analysis really ties back to that first question of what is required to manage frequency for credible events out to 2025. To answer this, we used a power system model where we tripped a large generator, our credible risk, to simulate frequency responses under varying system conditions that reflect each of the changes individually. Now, in the interest of time, while there are five things listed here, we'll go through only a selection of the results that are highlighted now in purple. But if you're after the full detail, I strongly recommend having a look at section B4 of the frequency appendix report to get an idea of the whole picture. In our power system model, simulation parameters that lined up to the various changes on that previous slide were fed as inputs into different components on a single bus model of the mainland NEM. From the representation of the single bus model you can see on your screen at the moment, we can see that there are four basic categories of components as part of this model. 
The first one being the online inertia. The second being the demand or total load on the system, including any associated load relief, remembering that prior to the event, it's important that load balances it out with the generation. So that frequency is at that 50 hertz. The third one is the amount of reserve consisting of the base reserve model and a percentage of reserve having faster response characteristics than the base reserve model. So our base reserve model itself was built to have performance characteristics that represented a typical thermal unit set up to meet the specifications of the six second contingency FCAS market. And this was because the six second contingency FCAS market is the fastest contingency FCAS market in the NEM and it's the product that is designed to arrest frequency. Finally, the last component is the risk that would be tripped, which includes any additional secondary risks from the distributed PV tripping off. From this model, we obtain a frequency response of the system. And as you can see on the slide, we assess it against the frequency containment requirements of the frequency operating standard, or FOSS for short. So here we can see that frequency was arrested on this particular run, as we had enough reserve to fully replace all the active power that was lost during the event. However, this curve drops into the red zone below the FOSS requirement of 49.5 Hz before it becomes arrested. If we then increase the amount of reserve on the second trace, we have now met that FOSS. So what this shows us is with the same speed of response from our base reserve model, we need a larger amount of reserve not only to arrest frequency, but also meet the FOSS requirements. And this was the iterative process that was taken to determine how much reserve is required for a given set of system conditions. As we vary the system conditions in line with actual changes in the system, we can summarize these reserve requirements on inertia reserve curves, which we'll now have a look at for each of the results from the changes that were highlighted in purple before, starting with decreasing inertia. On this slide, we have the base case inertia reserve curve here, which is also a great starting point to help us understand the impacts of decreasing online inertia levels. Before we do that though, in the appendix report, there's quite a few of these charts, so it may help to just step through the different components of this one. So firstly, the six second reserve requirement on the y-axis refers to the amount of frequency responsive reserve as measured at six seconds, which you'll recall is the measurement point for our fastest contingency FCAS product. In the case of this curve, we only have the base reserve model. So the y-axis would be the total amount of headroom with assumed response characteristics of our base model that we would need to arrest the frequency and meet the FOSS. On the x-axis is pre-contingent inertia which, if you'll recall, has an impact on how fast the frequency will change following our disturbance. Other study parameters that weren't being varied as part of this set of studies are usually given in the title. This includes things like the size of the risk and the load on the system and any associated load relief. Any parameters that were being varied as part of the study will be shown in the legend and we'll see that later on. Finally, what this means is that each point on the curve represents the amount of reserve required under the modeled system conditions to meet the FOSS. And what we can see as we look along this curve is that as we move into the lower ends of inertia, particularly beyond historical levels, the required modeled reserve to meet the FOSS kicks up in a non-linear manner. And that needs to be managed accordingly as we go into lower and lower levels of inertia. The second change that we'll now go through is the impact of changing reserve dynamics. While our base case on the previous slide and here in the red were based off a typical thermal unit's response to frequency, it is important to know that reserve comes in a range of speeds across a range of different technologies. Today, at the faster end of the spectrum, are batteries and inverter-based resources, which are programmable down to hundreds of milliseconds. In addition to this, there's also switch reserve, which does not have a dynamic response to frequency. Rather, switch reserve consists of large or aggregated loads that have switching controllers that allow them to automatically switch out of the system. And thereby, when we lose a generator, they can decrease demand on the system and bring the system back into balance. On this inertia reserve chart, we have a comparison between our base case and two cases, 
each with 30% of the volume on the y-axis having performance characteristics set by a typical battery in grey and a typical switch reserve settings in blue. What we can see in both cases is that the curve shifts downwards, meaning less reserve, as measured at 6 seconds, is required when we have faster response in the reserve mix. This is pretty good news that there's opportunities from the changing reserve dynamics on the system. However, these reserve products do respond differently to the typical thermal units we're used to having on the system, and therefore having them as part of the mix can increase the complexity of operation. As that proportion of faster reserve increases significantly, how they are managed and integrated therefore needs to be considered very carefully. So if you're interested in that, have a look at section B4.7 of the appendix report for more detail. The last piece of analysis using our power system model was in relation to these emerging secondary risks. As Andrew mentioned before, a secondary risk is the coincidental trip or reduction of generation from some of the newer devices on our network alongside a large generator. In this graph, the secondary risk that was studied was in relation to the tripping of distributed PV. So in recent historical events, we have seen that distributed PV devices can trip off during voltage disturbances, which typically happens when we have an electrical fault on the system. In terms of frequency, when this trip of distributed PV coincidentally occurs with the trip of a large thermal unit, the total risk size of the event increases, and this manifests itself on this inertia reserve curve as a shift upwards from the red curve to the orange and purple ones, which have 1% and 5% of the online distributed PV tripping off alongside our credible risk. As we start getting more and more distributed PV with these characteristics installed, the reserve requirements could increase pretty significantly. We also see a similar effect from the dynamic behavior of utility scale inverter-based plants during a disturbance. This is particularly true for wind farms that may take longer to recover their output following a disturbance. How we effectively manage these secondary risks becomes an important part of the picture for future planning, which I'll now throw back to Andrew to tell you a little bit more about. Thanks, Jane. So just to recap on some of the results and what they mean for managing credible risks. As Jane described, if we keep the speed of our frequency control the same, we're going to need a greater volume of that frequency sensitive reserve under the forecast conditions. The introduction of faster reserve can lower that overall volume, but when that reserve is very fast, um, often termed fast frequency response in the order of hundreds of milliseconds, care needs to be taken about how it's integrated, where it's provided and how it's delivered. Switched response is also helpful in lowering that overall volume of frequency sensitive reserve required under low inertia conditions. But as we require a minimum amount of dynamic response on the system, there is an overall upper limit of how much of that switched response can be accommodated. We've seen how the secondary risk of distributed PV can change the outcome of credible events. This impact is going to increase as the penetration of distributed PV grows. Um, the case that we've looked at here is for the system intact, but under special conditions, such as where a part of the system is islanded, the secondary risk of distributed PV can be even more onerous. So moving away from credible risks into non-credible risks, Non-credible risks are risks that are more onerous than a credible event. They can include the trip of multiple generation units or the trip of double circuit transmission lines. While rare compared to credible events, non-credible events do occasionally happen on the system. These events are managed through a combination of primary frequency response and emergency frequency control schemes such as under frequency load shedding. So under frequency load shedding is made up of blocks of customer load that is disconnected automatically in a controlled way in response to a large under frequency event. So in that graphic there, we can see that for the mainland, we maintain frequency within 49.5 Hertz for the trip of a single generator. Um, when we have a larger event than that, the frequency goes down to 49 Hertz. That's the region where under frequency load shedding can start to help manage those events. For the renewable integration study, we looked at factors that are changing the risk profile of non-credible events.
So as we've heard, inertia and load relief are declining. This means that the rate of change of frequency levels are projected to increase. There's potential for a higher rate of change of frequency during non-credible events as the amount of generation or load loss can be higher. Rate of change of frequency can be further exacerbated by secondary risks, such as the loss of distributed PV through voltage disturbances, as Jane has told us about. But additionally, for large frequency swings possible during non-credible events, distributed PV can also be lost due to under or over frequency trip or disconnection due to high rock off. Distributed PV penetration into under frequency load shedding blocks can also reduce the effectiveness of this emergency last line of defense. For more information on this issue, there's some additional detail in the Appendix A report, the distributed PV report and the associated webinar. On top of these things, the behavior of utility scale inverter based plant and also run back and intertrip schemes are making the system more complex. The combined result of all of these changes is that the risk profile of non-credible events is changing, with the outcomes potentially worse than those seen historically for comparable events. Non-credible separations or islanding of a part of the system are a specific kind of non-credible event that deserve some attention. Historically, there have been instances of islanding South Australia or Queensland through the trip of double circuit transmission lines disconnecting these regions from the rest of the network. South Australia has separated from the rest of the NEM nine times in the past 10 years, including non-credible separations in 2018, 19 and 20. As another example, New South Wales and Victoria recently separated due to the bushfires. So in the area of managing complexity, AMO is taking action along with industry to improve frequency control, including actions that will improve the outcomes of non-credible events. The implementation of the mandatory primary frequency control rule change will assist in shoring up the provision of broad-based primary frequency response and will improve the system's resilience to these non-credible events. This will be increasingly important under low inertia conditions. AMO is also progressing work in collaboration with distributed network service providers in understanding and managing distributed PV penetration into under frequency load shedding. In the area of rate of change of frequency, there is more work needed to quantify the maximum permissible rate of change of frequency under the projected conditions, including the levels at which the disconnection of distributed and utility scale generation becomes material. In the case of non-credible separations, some level of primary frequency response will be required in the separated region for it to successfully island and continue to operate. AMO is continuing to investigate the appropriateness of regional contingency FCAS requirements that may be needed to ensure a base level of primary frequency response. So we'll now take these results and look at some of the actions that are needed to manage the transition into these lower inertia environments and to manage frequency more generally out to 2025. So as we've heard, as the system continues to change, there's a need to revise the ancillary service arrangements to ensure that the speed and the volume of the primary frequency response match the range of future conditions. Faster frequency response allows the power system to operate at lower levels of inertia. However, no large power system operates without inertia and some level of synchronous inertia will be needed for the foreseeable future. To manage the transition to low inertia, a staged approach is recommended. This would allow the frequency control design to be adapted to the changing system with the capacity built in advance of the requirement becoming evident on the system. It will also allow for the operational experience to be built up progressively. Implementing broad-based primary frequency response, as well as understanding rate of change of frequency limits and improvements to AEMO's system frequency model are enablers for further transition to low inertia. So a recap on some of the actions going forward across non-credible and credible events.
Along with the actions already underway in the area of frequency control, AMO will publish a frequency work plan to address the challenges presented in the frequency section of the Renewable Integration Study. This work includes revising ancillary service arrangements, investigating the introduction of a system inertia safety net for the mainland NEM under system intact conditions to facilitate the stage transition to low inertia as operational experience is built up and additional measures are put in place to ensure security. There's further work to do in defining rate of change of frequency limits and investigating distributed PV penetration into under frequency load shedding. There's also work to do in limiting the overall provision of switched FCAS so that there's a minimum amount of dynamic response available, as well as investigating regional contingency FCAS requirements. Updating AMO's frequency modeling tools will allow us to get the best view of the system under these expected conditions. So to put these actions together with the actions out of the other sections of the Renewable Integration Study, this chart shows a view of the instantaneous penetration of wind and solar generation as a proportion of underlying demand. More information on this chart is provided in the RIS technical webinar. As we move up in the instantaneous penetration, we progressively encounter limits and challenges represented by the coloured zones. The frequency action highlighted orange commences at the existing penetration as we need to start updating our practices on managing frequency due to this shift in the physical parameters of the system and the introduction of new risks. The shaded area in pink represents the staged reduction in inertia through the use of an inertia safety net towards the inertia provided by the minimum system strength requirements or the set of units that must be online to support system strength in each region. It is expected that this managed lowering of inertia in conjunction with the other measures detailed in the RIS would allow the system to operate at instantaneous penetrations of wind and solar of up to 75%. So a reminder that this webinar on managing frequency is one of a set of five webinars on the Renewable Integration Study. Thank you for watching.